very priestly prayer or a portion of it. Out of John 17. Familiar verses to the many of you I know. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. <clears throat> Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. God bless the meeting of his word. Please stand as we uh, continue our worship in song. church is, 
our brothers and sisters in Christ. That we're redeemed by His marvelous grace, His love. And so we come, mourning at times over our sin, rejoicing at times over His blessings, always aware of our need of Him. So let us pray over these elements and then we'll prepare to pass them out. Bill, ask the Lord to bless both the bread and the wine today, please. Father, we approach this table with hearts full of gratitude for your marvelous word. For for the seed that was planted, the body of Christ spilled blood, and in it the kingdom of God has been brought forth. Yes. It's been brought forth in the lives of people, taken forth in our hearts, and it's grown. Thankful to you, Lord, for your marvelous church that you were raised up. We're thankful for you, to you for the gospel, that great and marvelous message. Jesus died, buried, resurrected, and lives and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And there from there he is building his church. Bless us this morning, Lord, as we come to the table. Let our hearts be full of gratitude. Thankful to you, Lord, for your marvelous and wonderful going to come down the middle aisle, two lines, and uh, receive communion by intinction. Intinction is an old word. It just simply means tear a piece out of the loaf, dip it in the fruit of the vine, and eat and drink the body and blood of the Lord. And if you want to be served where you are, uh, Hartley is going to be moving around, so just get his attention. He'll find you and can serve you there. The rest of us will come here. So we're prepared. The meal is ready. Let's stand, form two center aisle lines, and go back around the side. Our request and prayer to the Lord, which we do about this time each uh, Sunday. And we're going to trust Him to meet the needs of those for whom we've been praying, and uh, we're thankful for answered prayer. When you watch the prayer sheet or or we'll do it by other means sometimes. We'll get answered prayer reports to you as well to make the changes on the uh, prayer sheet that you'll pick up today for Wednesday night. And uh, continue to pray that the Lord will do His work in lives, in our community, in our state, in our nation, and in His church and the nations around the world. It's a huge prayer request field. But we're joining other people just reaching out to the God we know who hears us when we pray. How many of you believe, you thought about this recently, believe that when you pray, God hears our prayers? How many believe that? Because if, if He doesn't hear them, then uh, why pray? We're not praying just to be heard speaking, but we're talking to the Lord. And He knows our heart. He knows the very moaning cry of our heart when we can't even express in words what we feel, crying out. And he's at work in you and me and us as the body of Christ. This one small part of what God is doing right here in Montgomery County. And I'm looking forward to seeing what he does. Looking forward to seeing him open hearts and minds and lives, change them. Looking forward to seeing him make well those who are sick along the way. One of these days we're going to all be healed. We're going to be home with Jesus. There will be no sickness. Well, none. Uh, he heals all our diseases, the psalmist said. And one day in his presence there will be none, for sure. And we notice from time to time that he answers prayer miraculously, supernaturally. And at other times he takes us through processes, but he's always at work in us, 
shaping us together to be like Jesus. To be like His Son. Like our Lord. And it's not about necessarily you as an individual or me as an individual being perfectly like Jesus. It's about His body being like the head yes. of this His church. So we keep talking to Him, trusting Him, <coughs> looking to Him, having confidence in Him. So let us pray. And uh, I'll I'll try to mention as many as we need to mention, but mostly we're looking to the Lord together for a variety of things. So let us let us pray together. Father, I want to thank you first of all for the week past and your faithfulness in the lives of your people in this place. And I want to thank you, Lord, for being with us in the week to come. We thank you ahead of time, knowing that your grace will be sufficient for us as we live. And that there will be opportunities that we can't even think about figuring out. That you will open to us as your witnesses. And we'll have the opportunity to share that precious name above all names. Jesus Christ the Lord with others. So bless your people and prepare them today to be able to speak a word for the reason for the hope they have within them. The hope that goes beyond this world and beyond all the various conflicts that are going on in the world, the hope that is anchored in Jesus and is coming again to receive us to himself. And so, Lord, as we pray today, we pray for brothers and sisters everywhere around the globe. We pray that your church will be strong in every place. We pray for your people that you might work in them and through them in this coming week, wherever they are, bearing witness to others who do not know you. And we pray, Lord, that you'd wrap your arms around each one who belongs to you on every continent and in every nation and give them peace and strength and grace to live through the situation they're in right this moment. For your grace is sufficient for every need. And may your church, living in its respective places, bear witness to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. May your church live as if followers of the Lamb of God live as if a people forgiven and made brand new, a people who have a hope beyond this world. And Father, we pray for one another, asking you to continue the work that you've started, building into our lives the things that you want to put there in order to use us the way you have desired to use us as we live as yours in this world. Father, as we pray for your church, we pray for the church across America, we pray for the church in Montgomery and surrounding counties. And we pray for a specific congregation simply to acknowledge that we too are a part of a visible, active, living people right here in this part of the world. And so we pray today for the First Baptist Church congregation of Conroe, lifting that people to you and asking you to work in their lives even today as they worship. And then in the week ahead, let the truth of the gospel be brought forth through their lives. Let their light shine. Let them be the salt that you've made them to be, the light that you've made them to be, as they live in their respective workplaces and neighborhoods. We pray, Lord, that your name will be exalted through that congregation. And we pray for the Kingdom Harvest Church of God in Christ, lifting that congregation to you. Praying, Lord, that the gospel preached from the pulpit will be clear, centered, where it ought to be in the Word of God, lifting and exalting the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Redeemer, the Savior, who delivers the sinner from his sin, makes him a child of God. And we pray, Lord, for the living Savior Lutheran Church in Montgomery, asking you to work in that relatively new church plan, asking you to have your way in that congregation, asking you to bless those who lead that they might preach and proclaim and live the gospel. Those who follow, that they too might bear witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray all of those same things for the whole of the body of Christ all around us. We pray it as well for Christ Church right here on League Line Road, that we might bear witness to this gospel we believe, that we might be usable vessels in your hand, that we might arise in the morning and realize that we belong to you and that you have a purpose for us that day and enter the day with that in our minds as we go about our work, go about our living. 
We pray today for the leadership of our country. We ask you, Lord, to continue to be merciful to us as a people, as a nation. We're thankful, so very thankful for the freedoms that we've enjoyed. We're thankful for the liberty we have to worship like this. We can be out in front in the parking lot worshiping the, this way, and we have the freedom to do it. And we're thankful, Lord, for that. And we pray that you will continue to be merciful to us as a nation, even as we make decisions as a nation that are leading us in a direction opposite and away from what you have revealed to be the truth that you have given us. And so we ask for mercy. We ask you to be a God who continues to favor a people unworthy as we've always been, and yet remind us, Lord, that we have responsibility to an authority that is beyond us and above us, this holy God who made us a nation in the first place. So, Father, we pray for the leadership of the United States of America. We pray for the president today, President Obama, his family. We pray for those who serve in his cabinet. We pray for those who are in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, who sit on the judge's bench and make decisions that influence our future and our way of being. We pray that the gospel will come and influence the whole, whole thing regarding uh, leadership, politics, that your influence will be evident through those, your witnesses, that are planted in strategic places as the Holy Spirit works. Thank you for your mercy to us. We thank you for your continued work in Justin. We pray for Ian and Misty. We just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to them, for the healing of his body. For Frankie, we lift her up to you today and ask for mercy and grace and help. We thank you, Lord, for working in Joe. Joyce is worshiping with us today, for which we're grateful. Bless Joe Stanley today. Encourage his soul, his heart. Cause him to see and know your presence, even now. We thank you, Lord, for your continued healing of Charlie, however you want to do that. There are a lot of things to decide yet, but you're the God who is guiding he and Joan, and we pray that you will provide wholeness and healing for him. And I thank you, Lord, that you're at work in John, able to worship with us today, first time in a long time. And we're thankful, Lord, for your blessing in his life as he sits in your presence, as he was a part of that communion service, and recognizing who his Redeemer and his Lord and his healer is. Father, we pray for Debbie today, not able to be here. Sandy's report a little while ago. We lift up Debbie and Sandy, her caregiver, her sister. We ask you to strengthen Debbie today. Give her some rest. Didn't sleep. Uh, not very clear on things this morning. We just pray that you touch her now as we pray here. As your people agree together for Debbie, we ask you to touch her with healing in your wings. And we ask you to bring peace and grace to Sandy today as she walks in love with her sister. All of our sick and all of those going through various procedures or tests, we just ask you to be with us. We ask you to guide our steps. And we ask you to use us like you want to, that we might bear witness to Jesus. We thank you for the word of God. Uh, amazed at how much you loved us to send your only begotten son into the world to die for sinners like us. Those who were outside all of your blessing, who were living in the world and feasting on good things with no right to it at all, going our own way, yet you loved us enough. And you loved this creation enough to send your only begotten Son into the world. And we're thankful to be a part of the kingdom he's building. We're thankful for the hope that you've given us regarding this whole creation. But when the sons of God are finally brought to a place of maturity and hope, then new heavens and a new earth follow. So the whole of everything is finally saved and made new. We're thankful for that, that hope we have as we live every day. Thank you, Lord, for blessing your people today. Thank you for having your way with us as we worship, as we hear your word, and as we respond to it. We'll give you praise for all you are, all you do. We submit to you. We love you. And we thank you for your faithful love. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Why don't we stand right where we are and greet people close to you? Right across the aisle, right in front of you. Greet the time. I only said it twice, which is not too bad. I just, I delayed the third one. That was the Well, we're glad you're here. Glad that you who visit with us are here today and uh, all the familiar faces. And those who are getting more familiar, every Sunday we see you and you become... You know, I grew up in, in a church all through the years when I was growing up and then as a pastor for a lot of years. Uh, once you showed up three weeks, you were part of it. That's just how it was. You were. You must have been committed to it. You'd shown up three times. And uh, the funny thing about it... Uh, we who were pastors during those days knew who our sheep were. We knew who belonged in the part of the church. And we ministered to everybody anyway. You know, if they let us, we ministered to them. And if there were needs, uh, we were there. But you knew who were the people making the church what it was, who were part of it. So, since I've got that old thing in me, I've already counted some of you part of us on this third or fourth week, so that's a good thing, isn't it? Good thing. Glad you're here. And it's a, it's a great day. And this is the seventh Sunday of Easter. Now, that's church calendar liturgy. Uh, you had Easter Sunday and then six more Sundays, uh, this making the seventh Sunday of Easter. Now, that's the end of it. That's on the, on the church liturgical schedule. Next week is Pentecost. So if we could prepare our hearts and uh, deal with living for Jesus in the world through First Peter like we've been looking at it because of the resurrection of the dead, the fact that we've been given new life and we're capable of living in the world for the Lord, we're going to find ourselves opposed sometimes that there is going to be and has been through the history of the church suffering because of your identity with Jesus, because of who you are. And in some parts of our world, suffering is a major thing. Martyrs are still being martyred. Men and women are still giving their lives because of their identity with Jesus. And we have been blessed in that we have not suffered the kind of persecution that many Christians in various parts of the world have suffered. And we, uh, we've been blessed in that we have not had those kind of challenges. And now we have to think about that a little bit as our nation swings farther and farther away from the foundations upon which we were built. The standards that belong to the Christian church. And there may be a necessity, a stand on our part that will cost us <coughs> opposition that we have not tasted before. But we won't do that just trying to make trouble. We will end up doing that by identity with Jesus. By taking a position that is biblical, true. And not being willing to leave that position for the sake of the gospel and the glory of God. So we live, right? Right? We live. Now, in 1 Peter, and I've taken every text since Easter Sunday from 1 Peter, and this will be the last 1 Peter text in this series, and we're going to be looking at Scripture in chapter 4, alongside Scripture in chapter 5, 1 Peter. But we started at the very beginning in chapter 1, the introduction of Peter's letter, and it talked about the fact that we've been begotten, or born again. And that we've been given some things in the new birth that we've received in Jesus Christ. An inheritance that is waiting for us. An inheritance that will not lose any of its shine or potency. An inheritance that's centered in the return of Jesus Christ. And while we're living in the world in the hope of glory, we're going to face some trouble. And the people that Peter is writing to, these... these uh, exiles into what would be modern day Turkey, the northwestern side of uh, Asia Minor, north, were suffering some trouble. We don't know how severe it was at first. Uh, most of the trouble I have faced as a believer has been 
what we might just call annoyance. And you have some opposition that's just annoying. It's not hurting you very much. It's not causing any real pain. But it just annoys you. Somebody creates some conflict for you because you're serving Jesus and got these ideas. Let me tell you how simple mine were. Just a little illustration and we're going to go to the sermon. When I pastored my home church in Decker Prairie, how many know where Decker Prairie is? Very good. Houston is a suburb of Decker Prairie. <laughs> and you just as well say that now because you can barely drive through Decker Prairie without 500 cars running over you all at once. And I pastored a little wood frame church right in the heart of Decker Prairie, what used to be 149, now 249 with all those lanes, and then it was just a little two-laner, and uh, just before you turn left and to go around to, you know, kind of like uh, Decker Prairie Rose Hill connection was a little white frame church that was my growing up place, known as the Decker Prairie Gospel Mission. That's how it started, as a mission church out of a church in Houston. And every one of those churches was started or worked in establishing, it was established by a brother of a family. These, these four brothers involved in ministry, lay people, started these churches. And I happened to make connection there when I was a kid. And um, my grandmother was having gotten saved. My mother drove her to church and we, we decided to go closer to home instead of over to Huffsmith. We went to Huffsmith early on at the Apostolic Faith Church. Then ended up at Decker Prairie Gospel Mission, later became uh, Decker's Chapel, which I then, after years of living there and being a part of it, uh, became its pastor. All 20, 25 of its people, I got to be its pastor. Yeah. It was marvelous. I said I'd never come there, and I finally had the one that went and talked to him and said, I'd like to come here. Can you imagine? It? <laughs> I'd like to pastor this church. And uh, it was a marvelous challenging, work-filled experience all the way through. But I was able to pastor there. When the church started growing like, like crazy, we filled the little building, and I had a children's church, so I put a tent up beside the building, a little, little tent, and used it year-round, and we had children's church there. Well, one time some young adults, basically, not quite grown up, came in the night with flowers, like cooking flour, white stuff. And they'd gone inside my children's church and threw it all over everything. All the chairs were coated white. Everything was coated white. And it just, my uh, sanctification was on a great superior. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have had that experience, maybe a little sanctification pushed to the edge. And uh, we didn't find it till Sunday morning. Of course, because it happened on Saturday night. And we, we, I knew I knew immediately somehow who it was, and it was. And uh, we couldn't do anything about it because we couldn't prove it, but we knew who it was. So we just cleaned it up and had children's church, and we just kept growing. And God was blessing. But that was an annoyance. It wasn't really a persecution. It was just an annoyance. Um, and I chose to believe. That we somehow as believers living for Jesus, actively witnessing door to door, were somehow disturbing some people. And I thought that was okay. That's good. Yeah. So as a young 20-some-year-old kid, I said, that's fine, let's clean it up and go. Put more kids in. And it was an experience, but it was just an annoyance. That's what I call my persecution. A little annoyance with flour along the way. You're not hearing me? No. no. Okay. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Good. I'm hearing me. <laughs> so as long as I'm hearing me, it must be out there somewhere, right? And along the way. But every chapter of 1 Peter has something to say about suffering and connects that suffering to the suffering of Christ. Because he's the one we're following, right? That the very um, picture of what we're suffering, Jesus suffered. I mean, he's the only righteous one. So it was the righteous suffering from the unrighteous, I being one of the unrighteous, and you, in order that we might be saved. And once we are born again, we're going to live in a world 
that is opposed to God. There is none righteous, no, not one in the world. That's what Paul said. There is no one who seeks after God. They seek after something, but not after the holy God that's going to change their lives. We then live in the world and can, if we serve the Lord biblically and according to His Word and stay with it as things change, we're going to possibly face some suffering. And if we suffer, we need to recognize that there is a way to find communion or fellowship with Jesus in our suffering. Hang on, we'll go there in the text. Let me read it. Fourth chapter, beginning at verse 12. Listen to these three verses. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Jesus, for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now some, uh, some of the different pieces of scripture they found with this text say it this way, the spirit of glory and the power and of God rests upon you. And then he goes on to say in this fourth chapter, that we're not to suffer for doing evil or wrong. We're, if we're going to identify with Christ and His suffering, we suffer because of Him. We suffer because of our identity with Him, because of our walk with Him, because of our life for Him. And the suffering comes sometimes in that. Now, verse number 6. And I want to read uh, verse 5 before that text. Likewise, chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now, the preceding four verses are instruction to the elders of the church or the churches that are scattered in Asia Minor North. And this is a great piece of scripture. Telling those who are under shepherds to the great shepherd and ministry to the body of Christ, the kind of attitude we are to have. And it's a marvelous, marvelous piece of scripture. We're supposed to shepherd the flock of God among us exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. That's a humble type, shepherding. And he goes on to say, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. That's what we're living toward. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, Clothe yourself, yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The challenge to put on this humility is for all of them as it is for all of us. Not just shepherds, uh, but everybody. Shepherds, younger, all the flock. Everybody. Put on this humility. Uh, Humility. Humility, we've talked about humility several times in the last couple of years, and it's important for us to again recognize that to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God is a pretty positive thing to do. It's what He wants us to do. It's how we're going to live effectively and freely for Him. And then He went on in this text to say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And the first Old Testament text that actually says basically that is in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. And then it's quoted other places in the New Testament, this particular statement. And in the line of the fact that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, here's, here's the instruction. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. More imperatives. Listen, be sober-minded, be watchful. Now he introduces an enemy. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Your adversary, 
Diabolos is the word used here. The devil. Like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And here's some more imperative. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The same kind of fiery trials now that you're facing, your brotherhood around the world is facing. Yours is not unique to the rest of the church, is what he's saying. Your suffering is like what's happening to your brothers and sisters in other places. There's this brotherhood of believers that encompasses the globe. The one church of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, and after you have suffered a little while, verse number 10, the God of all grace who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's the promise. And then the doxology. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The worship, the praise on the part of Brother Peter. Now, let me quickly run through what seems to be revealed in this part of the letter. The threat to the people of God that Peter is writing to must have escalated. It seems that it has with the statement about the fiery trial here all the way down in the fourth chapter of the twelfth verse. Uh, I doubt seriously if Peter along with Silas or Silvanus sat down and wrote the letter all at one setting. I think the letter was put together a little time and there was some communication maybe by carrier between him and the church he was writing to, not sure. But he knows the trial is on, or it is about to be. So he says in that 12th verse of chapter 4, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. It's going to move from annoyance to ordeal. It's going to be more than just a neighbor saying, don't park on my grass. I've had that experience too. You ever had that experience? It was my introduction to a new neighbor. We had the front of a vehicle overextending on his grass just a little. And he came with a big sign and said it right there. Do not park on my grass. In my yard or whatever. So we never did again, and we never had very good relationship with that neighbor either, because we never had a chance to talk about anything. But I, you know, those kind of things are not fiery trials; they're just little things to deal with. This is going to be more of an ordeal for these people. And uh, he said back in verse number seven of chapter four, writing yet before that about how we're going to live and dealing with the sufferings and the struggles. The end of all things is at hand. Be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And I, I think that we believers ought to be looking for Jesus no matter what era of time we're living in and that we ought to recognize the time is at hand because we only get about 70, 80, 90, 100 years and we're gone from here. And if we stay here until Jesus comes back, that's marvelous. But if we go by way of death, we're going to meet him. Absent from the body present of the Lord, and so we're going to answer ultimately to Him for how we were while we were here, regardless of when we leave. So we got this suffering that God will take and use in order to shape us to be like His Son. When churches face trouble, they have the opportunity to look to God for the answers and the help and the strength and all of that, and to make sure they deal with the enemy, which is not people. Our enemy is not against flesh and blood, but we have a warfare against spiritual entities or powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The devil and his operatives are out there, and I'm not an expert on all the different parts of that. We only have so much in Scripture. But our warfare is always against the spiritual enemy, the enemy of God, actually, yeah. that we find ourselves in conflict with. And what happens most of the time is that we get man between us and the enemy. Uh, yeah. And we end up in conflict with a, another human as our enemy. Rather than dealing with the real enemy that's out to get the church. Peter is providing some comfort 
to these believers he's writing to by suggesting that the sufferings that Christians undergo find their archetype and their fulfillment in the sufferings of Christ. That's just how it works. I got to thinking about this yesterday afternoon in a long time. Um, we live out the pattern of the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's revealed in our baptism when we are born again and submit to baptism. We are buried with Christ, dead to sin, dead to sin, alive to God. We're raised up, resurrected to a new life. Now this is pointing toward the real, final resurrection when Jesus comes. This is not the resurrection that we're living toward. This is the resurrection that makes it possible for us to live toward. Yes. This is the spiritual reality of our lives. Raised with Christ, indwelt by the Spirit, we're now ready to live toward the day when Jesus comes back again. We're ready now to have our minds renewed. We're ready now to live according to the Holy Spirit's leadership and power and help. We're ready to follow Jesus in the world as we head toward the day when we leave the world. Amen. Won't that be a day? Yes, but think about this day. Because right now, right now, we share in His suffering when we go through trouble because of our identity with Him and we're going to share in His victory as well. Yeah. We're going to share in his, in his coming again, his glory. That's a word. Coin and kneel, we've all heard, has to do with fellowship, body of Christ. So. Coin and AO is the word used and translated share in these texts. Basically the same root word. And so it talks about a fellowship with the sufferings of Christ. A communion with Him when we suffer. I'm going to talk about this a little bit to get it ringing. I can see it. Now, let, me, let me just take it somewhere where you can okay, and use this for an example. This is Peter we're talking about here. Listen to Paul as I read from Philippians chapter 3. He talks about all of the attributes he had with Judaism. The things he counted important, Paul does, in the third chapter of Philippians. And he zealously persecuted the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. But then he said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I count everything as loss when I look at this I have in Christ. Knowing Him. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness imputed to him because of what Christ has done. Not his own righteousness. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him, listen, and the power of his resurrection. Listen. And the fellowship of his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the out resurrection from among the dead. Which tells me Paul by this time is thinking maybe toward his own demise before Jesus returns. Because he's talking about a death similar, same, anticipating a resurrection. And he's been serving the Lord 35 years at least when he writes this letter. He wants that connection with the resurrection as we all, that's the new life. The resurrection begins with this new life we have in Jesus. We're raised from the dead. We were dead in sins 
separated from God, and by regeneration we have been resurrected. The resurrection has taken place. We have that relationship to Jesus raised from the dead spiritually, alive to God. The fellowship we have when we suffer with it is the fellowship of His sufferings. There's a communion in suffering for identity with Jesus. Not suffering that you bring on yourself. Suffering that results from His work in your life and through your life. Now we have to think about Paul. He says, that fellowship I want. I long for it. He tasted it already. He walked in this hard, struggling place. But here's the point. We not only suffer as Christ does, when we suffer as His, we participate in His sufferings. The same type of suffering before a holy God. Amen. I'm going to have to dig it out and write it down, right? So we can think about it together. Think about that. Now, this is... If, if you've studied church history, you know there was a time in early church history 2nd century, 3rd century. When there were people looking to be martyrs. They longed for martyrdom. To be killed because of their faith in Jesus and their service to the Lord. Why? I never in my life wanted to be that. I didn't want to say, yeah, I signed up, shoot me. <laughs> Jesus. That. The early church had an understanding. And I think some of it came from, from maybe overreacting to truth that was then messed up. They weren't supposed to be trying to die. They were supposed to remember the blessing of victory if they did die. Yeah. But it's funny how selfish we are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Even to have a desire <laughs> to be a martyr. I mean, after all, we're going to go to be with the Lord. We're going to be recognized in heaven. We're going to be with Him. It must be great reward to be a martyr. You know, remember us here forever. What a day that will be to be able to be a martyr. No, no, no. To be able to see Jesus, that's the day. Be at home with the Lord. But what Peter wanted us to understand, what Paul has somehow communicated in this Philippians letter is this. You don't so much worry about the suffering. You long for the intimacy with the one who knows you. You long to know him. That's Paul. To know him all through whatever he has to face. To get to know him better. And to be yielded to him in that knowing. I can tell you from my own experience, I was in my 30s when this when this text in Rome in the Philippians became a grab my heart text, and I lived with it for years, and I preached it and, and used the language of it in every sermon I probably ever preached along the way. Are you ready to know him? Do you know him? Are you hungry to know him? Do you have a desire with Paul to know him? And if you maintain that, and you could and sense his presence and his working in a congregation you were saying yes he's here yes I want to know him better and then you shift and you want to uh, get this message across or that message across and we move Jesus kind of to the side a little bit and focus on other things Theology is a wonderful study, but you can get yourself messed up if you get caught up in a theology that separates you from the Lord. And that can happen. Or divides you from your brothers. Yeah. Or makes you incapable of conversation without separating from them. Yeah. But I love this understanding of koinonia, which is like koinonia fellowship, a sharing of the sufferings of the Lord. <clears throat> because of that, Peter knew that those believers he's writing to would participate in his resurrection and ascension. They would be raised someday when Jesus comes to a new body, a new life, a new relationship with him. So that we might rejoice and be glad. Shout for joy. Peter pronounces comfort for the present and comfort for the future. 
In the future, the comfort is Jesus Christ is coming back again and when we see Him, we're going to be changed to be like Him. And we're going to be with Him where He is. That I can't exactly explain, but I can certainly hope for it. Yes. And it's a hope that's real. Yeah. <clears throat> His comfort for the present comes in statements like, when you're reviled, don't revile again. When you're persecuted, don't Try to do anything about getting even with anybody. Just look for His coming. And as you live today, don't get in the fight. Realize who your enemy is. Stay attentive to that enemy. Resist that enemy. But don't get into a conflict that is not your conflict. Just keep looking for the coming of Jesus. And live accordingly. Mm -hmm. Live accordingly. Live with your sights on Him. So we wait for the moment not yet come when we will shout for joy at the coming of Jesus. Do you think that will be quite a shout? Amen. <laughs> I promise you it will be. Indeed it will be. And then we have comfort in the present because when we are being reviled, we are blessed. I like that, don't you? Listen to it again. Rejoice Inasmuch, in as far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ or opposed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of power and of God rests on you. You understand that we're not going to be persecuted unless. His presence is with us and working in us. He's the one that gets persecuted. Yeah. We follow Him. Yeah. We do. Now here's, here's what I want to finish with in this uh, fourth chapter and do a little thing or two in the fifth. The persecution shows clearly that we live under God's Spirit and His authority. We are blessed under the God the Holy Spirit who is there with us, the very one who is working in us. And the way he said it in verse 14, we are blessed because the spirit of glory, of power, and of God rests upon us. So that is a clear thing. When God's spirit's within us and upon us, even in the middle of all the distress, we are blessed. Now, some of you say that now. You say you're blessed, but sometimes you wonder uh, whether the circumstance looks that good. But we are blessed when we understand what has been accomplished on our behalf. The Spirit of God is also the Spirit of glory in this text. And He rests upon those who are in Christ. He dwells in us. And through the Holy Spirit, the glory for which we, the faithful, wait is already made present. So what can I call it? What can I say that I say it like this in light of this text? We have in our lives a blessedness. We would say it this way. A blessedness that is upon us. You are blessed, he says, because the spirit of glory and of power and of God rests on you. Those of us who are born again and dwelt by the Holy Spirit Himself, who serve Jesus and walk with Jesus, are a people living blessed. We have about us a blessedness that the world didn't give us, nor can it take away. We can say to each other, we are blessed. Because His Spirit confirms to our spirit that we're the children of God. And a child of God in the world with the adversary prowls about like a lion. He's not a lion. He's like a lion. Now, he is a dragon, but he's already been kind of declawed by Jesus, hasn't he? Yes. He defeated him on the cross. So let me go just a step further. Here's what Jesus said about that. Um, that blessedness going into all this persecution is difficult. I don't know about blessing. Well, let me read it to you. Matthew 
Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus' words. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Blessed when all that happens. That's pretty good. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Verse 10 said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, but theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then blessed are those who have these things said about them and done to them. They too get the pronouncement of blessed. So blessedness is kind of the roof over the child of God. Somebody said, are you blessed? Yeah. How can you say that? My Lord who redeemed me is still on the throne at the right hand of the Father. Amen. And every authority, wherever it is, is being brought under Him. Yeah. So that finally, one of these days, there will be no authority outside of the authority of He who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Yeah. And I am His child. Blessed, yes. Amen. In the middle of every struggle, we're still blessed. Man. I'm not going to have time to uh, dig around in the humility part of this, and everybody glad of that, say amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what you want to say about humility is that sometimes uh, translated uh, as a slave's apron. It's what you put on according to that fifth verse of five. Not buying these certain things on. It's like putting on an apron that identifies you as a slave, servant in the house. Yeah. Maybe the uh, thing that inspired that thought from Peter was Jesus taking the towel in the basin mm -hmm. and wrapping the towel, tying it on him, and washing his disciples' feet in the upper room. Remember, nobody... Everybody wandered through the dust coming to the meal. There was no servant there to wash their feet. That's what you do when you went to somebody's place. Somebody would be there as a servant to wash your feet as you came in the house. The dust of the road. Nobody did that. And none of the disciples who were busy talking about still who was the greatest in this group of guys. Nobody got up to wash feet. So Jesus did. Mm -hmm. yeah. You got a basin and you got maybe maybe hanging behind the door was a slave's apron. Towel type material. And he put it on and washed the feet of his disciples. Now Brother Peter um, he never let him wash his feet. I love the humanness of Peter. No, 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 not mine, Lord. If I don't wash your feet and you have no part, well, wash me all. He still, still missed it. That's Peter. He wanted it, but he had a lot of misunderstandings about it. But at any rate, we're told to humble ourselves before God in verse number 6. Under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, in Philippians 2, we looked at that in this series a while back, and... Uh, Jesus is referred to there as having um, emptied himself. Came down as a man from his relationship in heaven, father. Became a man, became a servant, submitted to death for us. He went down all the way. And did that in order that we might be redeemed. Humbled himself before God. And then before that text is finished, when that work is done, God highly exalted. Yeah. so there was that humility in coming and obey that leads fully to that exaltation mm -hmm. I like the language because as we start this last little section of scripture we're told to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he exalt us will exalt us when's that exaltation going to take place when we see him coming when we meet him. When all those folk with the slave aprons, us, 
are able to see ourselves as he sees us when we are changed to be like him and are with him where he is. You know, we always talked about ruling with him. We love that position. Having authority. But it comes out of uh, humility. And the life is lived in that place of serving until he exalts us. Yeah. When he comes. I love to think about it. Amazing. And the promise is here, verse 6. Humble yourselves. Proper time he may exalt you. Verse 10. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who's called you will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. Those are promises. He will exalt you and he will do everything necessary to make you fully and completely his in every way. Keep you as you go there and finish it up by making you like himself as it ends. I love those kinds of promises. I really do. Now while we're living here, while we're living here, we may suffer some persecution. Are you ever, have you ever, I'm going to close, but have you ever thought about this for your own life? I guess we did, the preachers I grew up with did a better job than I've done at keeping us reminded that he's coming today. <clears throat> or he could be. Yeah. And I remember the kinds of songs we sang because we sang. And when you were a kid in a church like that or a teenager in a church like that and I started singing probably why are you sang with the congregation? I don't know, 13, 14. You're singing specials, they call them specials. They weren't that special sometimes, but we sang specials. <laughs> but then as the Lord was beginning to work in, in my life uh, in late teens, I remember singing a song that had this verse, Dear Lord, if I should die upon a foreign field someday. And I can't remember the next line. But it's about... I could pay no less than that because of what you've done for me. The song bears it out. The motivation for that kind of understanding is gratitude. I like what Packer says. J.I. Packer, who, uh, and I'm going to close with this because we don't have time to go to the end, but In his uh, book, Knowing God, many of you probably, several of you I know have read this. Some of us have read it a few times. And the chapter on the grace of God closes out with this. And he said, it has been said that in the New Testament, doctrine is grace. And ethics, or the way of life, is gratitude. And something is wrong, Packer says, with any form of Christianity in which experimentally and practically this saying is not being verified or shown to be true. Those who suppose that the doctrine of God's grace tends to encourage moral laxity, here's how we usually hear it said, final salvation is certain anyway, no matter what we do, therefore our conduct doesn't matter, unquote, are simply showing that in the most literal sense, now this is just like Packer. They do not know what they're talking about. I, I was in class with Dr. Packer at Regent. And uh, I loved his opening because every time he came to class, had two classes, that first class I took with him, had two sessions a week, hour and a half each. Every time he opened class, he'd say, stand with me, we're going to worship. And he'd lead us in the doxology. And we'd sing the doxology, all that. And it wasn't a small class, of course, Dr. Parker's class, but we would worship it. He said, theology is for doxology. The study of God is for the worship of God, in other words. And if you study God and do not worship God, you miss the point. So we will start with worship, he said. 
Here's why he says they don't understand it. For love awakens love in return. And love wants awakened, desires to give pleasure. And the revealed will of God is that those who have received grace should henceforth give themselves to good works, Ephesians 2.10, and gratitude will move anyone who has truly received grace to do as God requires and daily to cry out thus. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We sing that here. And every time we get to that verse, I have to say, that songwriter is right. That songwriter is right. And it is that understanding that will keep us yielded to the God who leads us and desire us to please Him yeah. as we live. We don't earn our salvation by trying to please Him. We try to please Him because we're saved, yeah. because He's made us His. That is the point. Yeah. Amen. That Amen. is the point. Amen. May God take us back to that more and more. May we find those songs and hymns, those profound statements that have been made before us in order that we might once again begin to acknowledge our great debt of love yeah. to the God who loved us while we were unlovely and without hope. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, I am so very thankful for a people who sit in these chairs today and whose very faces reflect hearts that truly do want to please you. These, Lord, are beautiful sheep, beautiful brothers and sisters. And I am so thankful for their faithfulness and for their walk with you and for their continued hunger to walk with you. And I pray, Lord, that if there are one or two or three in this room who do not yet know you, or they, they need to look at this afresh and anew to see how they walk before you, then I pray you would love them close. Draw them to yourself, touch them, bring change that will glorify you and edify the church and bless them. Let them remember their blessedness let them remember how great their salvation is and lead them in the way of the last day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song that confesses how we're going to live. So stand with me and sing. And if you want to be prayed for today, if you need something, you may come while we're singing. And we will be glad to pray. Okay? Let's sing. Thank you.